polynomials are everywhere, from the equations that describe electron orbitals to the basic components used in modern simulations. We will investigate high-order polynomials. One class of numerical methods, known as spectral methods, use such functions to achieve exceptional accuracy and computational speed. We will be looking at interpolation, which is loosely the process of creating a function passing through a set of given points and is used to approximate values and behaviors away from those points. From a certain perspective, interpolation is the interface from discrete real-world measurements to the world of simulation. Different building blocks can be used as a basis for interpolation, such as trigonometric polynomials, wavelets, radial basis functions, and splines, but we are going to restrict ourselves to algebraic polynomials in 1D. This seems like a simple problem, but the theory is deep and rich, drawing on algebra, complex analysis, calculus, partial differential equations, and orthogonal polynomials. We will provide some basic but useful analysis and give a glimpse at the bigger theory. Interpolation starts with a set of prescribed x-coordinates. At these nodes, we will provide calculated or measured values. The interpolating condition will require that the interpolated function takes on the provided values at these nodes. We'll start with a simple example. Before the advent of calculators, interpolation was frequently used to provide approximations for values of functions that were difficult to calculate by hand. Here we are given three nodes at 0, pi over 4, and pi over 2. We start by approximating the values for cosine between the first two nodes using simple linear interpolation, that is, passing a straight line between the points. We get a maximum error of 0.07. To increase accuracy, we could use all three points and fit a parabola and reduce the maximum error to 0.02. So far, it seems like we can achieve any desired accuracy by simply increasing the order of the polynomial and using more nodes. But does this actually work? Before proceeding, we need to do a little housekeeping. It is standard practice to perform work in the domain from negative 1 to 1. A simple transformation will map the desired region of interest to this domain. Now we will push the boundaries by trying higher orders and more nodes. On the left, we see the exact cosine function and a progression of higher order interpolants. On the right, we see the point-by-point -point error in the interpolation on a logarithmic scale. Very quickly, the interpolant matches the function so well the error is invisible on the left, and the maximum error is diminishing rapidly on the right. Now let's try this again with a different function, the so-called Runge function. Things aren't looking good. The interpolant is fluctuating wildly, and the error is actually increasing. Looking at a summary, we see for cosine the convergence is exponential until we reach the precision of the computer. But for the Runge function, the interpolant diverges from the true function. What went wrong? To figure out why interpolation works so well in one case and so poorly in another, we'll investigate one of the most important theorems in interpolation theory the Cauchy Interpolation Residual Theorem. It gives the error for an nth order polynomial, p sub n, interpolating an n plus 1 times differentiable function, f, at a point t. The error is 1 over n plus 1 factorial times the n plus first derivative of the function at some point in the domain, s, times a monic polynomial, with roots at the interpolation nodes. A monic polynomial has 1 as its leading coefficient. To prove the theorem, our first step is to simply state that the error is the difference between the function and the interpolating polynomial p sub n 
at the point t. Clearly, if t is one of the nodes, we need go no further as the error is zero. Otherwise, we extend the polynomial to interpolate at t as well. To do this, we borrow an idea from Newton's interpolation method. What polynomial could we add to our existing polynomial p sub n such that the old interpolation condition is unbroken? It is an n plus 1 degree polynomial, q sub n plus 1, with roots at the old interpolation nodes. To form this, let's take the product of the monomials x minus x sub j for all the nodes x sub j. Now we can scale q sub n plus 1 by a factor c without affecting the roots. We choose c so that when c times q sub n plus 1 is added to p sub n, the combination satisfies the interpolation condition at t. c is simply the error at t divided by the value of q sub n plus 1 evaluated at t. Adding c times q sub n plus 1 to p sub n gives r sub n plus 1, which interpolates at all the nodes and t as well. We note again that p sub n is an nth order polynomial, and q sub n plus 1 is an n plus first order monic polynomial. We differentiate f minus r sub n plus 1 n plus 1 times to find a zero. At least one such point s must exist somewhere by Rolle's theorem. After differentiating n plus 1 times, p sub n goes to zero because it has order less than n plus 1, and q sub n plus 1 becomes n plus 1 factorial because it's monic. We then rearrange to get the desired result. We now examine the factors in the Cauchy residual formula. The first factor is friendly and is one of the main drivers of quick convergence. The second factor, being innate to our function of interest, is out of our control. Note that the magnitude of the nth derivative of cosine of pi x grows like pi to the n. For the Runge function, this derivative grows much more rapidly. Note the point of evaluation s is dependent on both the function and the interpolation nodes, but we can't really engineer this in a general way. The last term is controllable, and we'll study it in a little more detail. On the left, we see the monic polynomial for various node configurations. On the right, we see the log base 10 of the absolute value of the associated monic polynomial. Note not only the size of the extrema, but also the relative size of the extrema near the center versus the edge. This ratio grows rapidly. Is there a better general purpose configuration for the nodes? It can be shown that an ideal asymptotic density of nodes is n over pi times the square root of 1 minus x squared. Nodes taken from the roots of the amazing Chebyshev polynomials happen to fit the bill. The Chebyshev polynomials are beautiful and worthy of study in general. Unfortunately, we can only introduce them. What? This doesn't look like a polynomial. But we see that t sub 0 of x is 1, and t sub 1 of x is x, and it is a trivial and fun exercise to derive the Rodriguez recursion relation using the multiple angle formulas. We can see one immediate benefit to the Chebyshev polynomials. The cosine restricts the output to the range negative 1 to 1. Watching the progression, we see that as the order increases, the variation of the extrema remains constant. Let's try interpolating the Runge function with the Chebyshev nodes. Wow, the oscillations have disappeared. The mighty Chebyshev nodes have turned divergence into convergence. Finally, we turn to some more advanced topics. 
and to explain exactly how the Runge function can fail and why the Chebyshev nodes still triumph. Unfortunately, the required background needs to grow, but there isn't time to build things up from first principles. It'll be a whirlwind tour. Still, we invite everyone to ride along and see the effects of issues that were hidden, but become apparent when you wear your complex sunglasses. First, we look at a contour map of the real component of the Runge function in the complex plane. We note that there are poles at plus and minus i over 4. The Runge function happens to be analytic in the strip between plus and minus i over 4. Next, we recall the upper bound on the value of the monic polynomial created from the nodes. We take the logarithm and add a 1 over n scale factor. We note that this is the form of a potential function satisfying the 2D Laplace equation, like an array of charges in a two-dimensional universe. What two-dimensional universe, you might ask? Why the complex plane, of course. We perform a contour plot of the potential, and we see that for the Chebyshev nodes, the contours are narrow and contain all the interpolation nodes. We superimpose the poles of the Runge function in white. On the other hand, for equally spaced nodes, the contours are wider and some don't contain all the interpolation nodes. We now show the final result without proof. It gives an upper bound on the error in the domain of negative 1 to 1, based on the supremum of the potential on the line from negative 1 to 1, labeled g sub p, and the value of the potential on the contour of a region containing the interpolation nodes where f is analytic, labeled g sub f. n is the order of the interpolant, and c is some constant. We see if g sub f is greater than g sub p, we have convergence, Otherwise, the interpolant diverges from the true function. While time constraints prohibit a proof, a key element is that interpolation of analytic functions can be expressed as a contour integral. We see that for the Chebyshev nodes, the poles of the Runge function sit in a region outside an equipotential containing the nodes, and we have convergence. While for equally spaced nodes, there is no equipotential contour containing all the nodes where the Runge function is analytic, and we have divergence. I hope you enjoyed and have a little more appreciation for humble interpolation.